It's eight o'clock, so let's uh, let's make a start. Um, and welcome to this uh, meeting of the Berkshire Ornithological Club. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome some new members. So we have Joan Hadley, Mick Fogel, Joshua Beals, and Paul Goldsmith. Um, if they're listening tonight, we wish you a, a long and happy association with the club. And if you're actually here in the uh, lecture hall, do, do come and make yourselves known to us. <clears throat> Before we get on to the main business of the evening, we've got a few announcements. Um, first of all, the photo competition is coming up very soon, March the 16th, and there's a deadline of March the 9th. No. Third. March the 4th. Okay. Um, three categories portrait, flight and action, and attention to detail. So, and, and also, there's going to be a new prize this year um, a prize for the best placed uh, photo from someone who hasn't won a prize before. So, that should encourage you. Uh, um, people who haven't entered before to take part. <clears throat> so upcoming meetings, the next meeting here is going to be by Juliet Vickery in two weeks time. She's the CEO of the BDO and she's going to talk about conservation of birds that cross continents and cultures. So that should be really interesting and maybe there's some parallels with a, a recent talk that we've had We've also got an outdoor meeting at Stanpit Marsh this Sunday. I'll be leading that. There's still time for you to express an interest if you want to come. Um, the final two announcements, I'll need my assistant to come forward. Uh, like I said uh, last time, we've had these uh, fabulous bird boxes made for us by Richard Sajak. You stand in front of the camera there, oh, yeah. that's right. Uh, beautifully made, and she's made um, quite a few in aid of the, um, the Berkshire Conservation Fund. He's not taking anything from for himself. And how many, uh, how many have you still got, Sue? Um, we still have six and we've got five more to come. Okay. So if you're interested, uh, please get in touch with Sue and she'll fix you up with one. Now, also at the at our last meeting, which was the seventy fifth anniversary meeting, um, we um, were expecting a little piece from Robert Gilmore, and we uh, we read out something right at the end. Uh, it wasn't actually his own words, but it turns out that he had written something in time for the meeting, but it just hadn't reached us. So I'm going to hand over to Sue again, and she's going to um, read what Robert Gilmore, our past president, um, has sent to the club. Okay. For anyone, individual or group, to reach 75 is well worth a get together and a raising of the glass. I don't know how many other members can claim to remember the BOC at its start. I was then, of course, very young. It's not me. In those early <laughs> days, it was the usual practice for the secretary to keep a detailed record of each meeting, to read out these minutes at the following meeting, and for them to be signed by the chairman as a correct record. Dr. Watson's minutes were often the highlight of the evening. When the club was started, there was no place for children in inverted commas, and it was a few years before I was allowed to become the first junior member. We were immensely fortunate that Duncan Wood and Eric Watson were among the club's original members, as both knew the world of ornithology and knew a rich choice of speakers for our meetings. I remember that Duncan saw me safely home after these early meetings, which finished very late for me. One memorable evening, the talk was given by James Fisher, and at the end of it, I approached the great man, clutching a book for his autograph. Surprised to see a small boy at such a late night meeting, and even more surprised to be asked to sign one of his own books. 
I still had the book, of course. Many years later, the job of arranging meetings continued to fall to the secretary, a post I was to hold for several years. On one occasion, I invited fellow wildlife artist David Reed Henry as guest speaker. I was confident of an interesting evening, particularly as he was usually accompanied by his handsome African hawk eagle. David had perched the eagle on a wooden saw bench, borrowed from the woodwork department, and in turn, this sat on the top of a large wooden map chest. Towards the end of the evening, David thought it time to show off his eagle's abilities on the wing, just a short flight across the front of the audience. The eagle's hood was, was removed and the time came for the launch. As intended, the eagle flew straight to its wood bench perch, which skidded across the top of the chest. Startled at this unexpected event, the eagle turned and spotted that the door of the projection room at the top of the theatre theater hall was open, and this provided the eagle with the only perch in sight. Yet again, however, his chosen perch was not stable, and again he was off on his travels around the biology lecture theatre. <laughs> I grabbed a leg of a saw bench, which happily the eagle was prepared to try again. This time his perch felt secure. David grabbed him and held on to his jesses. The whole event took far less time than it has taken me to write about it, but certainly gave the audience a thrill as the great bird swooped twice low over their heads. I wish I'd been there. This club has been an important and valued part of my life. I sent it my very sincere good wishes for the 75th anniversary and may the BOC continue to grow and flourish for many successful years in the future. Thank you. So, so we thank Robert Gilmore for his greetings and we wish him all the best. And we move on now to recent records. Um, what have people been seeing locally? Are there any hands up online? No. Colin. Well, I saw um, yesterday uh, someone said they'd seen white tails. Oh, was it you? Yes. Yeah. Um, right, okay, that was at um, Santos, and uh, I walked uh, through Shepherd Meadows today and saw it. Oh. So that's uh, Colin Wilson. He's um, mentioning that uh, a white tailed eagle was reported over Sandhurst, mm -hmm. over Horseshoe Lake, and his uh, Colin has been along Shepherd Meadows today and, and actually seen the bird today. What well, um, well, birds I'm aware of locally are the jack snipe at the Bells Lake, the hawfinch at Englefield this time, white fronted and pink footed geese are hanging on at Padworth Lane, but I think the bigger flock near um, Dinton has moved on. And there's been a, a scattering of firepress re records around the county. Okay, um, Alan Moore, if you unmute yourself and let us know what you've been seeing. <clears throat> Hi, yeah. Hello, yeah, I was, I was the one who saw the white-tailed eagle actually at um, Horseshoe Lake, Sandhurst. Initially, as I was coming down the hill towards the lake, <clears throat> large raptor, thought buzzard, didn't take a second to realise it was um, an eagle, obviously a white-tailed eagle. Flying plank it's described as, and it certainly was, long broad wings, long fingers, massive bill. And um, as it flew past me towards Sandhurst, or it didn't fly actually, it just glided. A uh, red kite attempted to mob it and it just ignored the kite as if it wasn't there and it was so much smaller than the, the eagle, it was, it was quite a sight. And it continued just to glide towards Sandhurst. So um, very pleased to get that sighting and it certainly is a very charismatic raptor. Yeah, well done, it's good sighting. Great. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of the announcements, so we can get on to the main business of the evening. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's many people here listening who are familiar with Otmore um, as a fairly uh, local wetland uh, place to visit, lots of birds to see. 
my, my memories go back much further. Um, I, I first visited the place um, as a student with some student friends in the 70s. Um, the fields were awash with cow swill, and for some reason we'd chosen to go there wearing sandals. But, <laughs> Our speaker tonight, Dave Wilding, I'm, he's been at Oxmoor working for the RSPB for 17 years, and I'm sure he's a lot better prepared than I was. I must be honest, I'm really impressed with this group. It's the first time, because we've kind of got this new world that we're living in, when you're kind of doing talks and, you know, I used to just coming up, you know, turning up at all or something and doing a talk on, you know, on your projectors and stuff like that. And then we've plus gone through the pandemic and then suddenly we had this, this kind of, evolution into the world of Zoom or Teams, and I actually discovered you can kind of do a talk from your bedroom. You know, I'm just sat there in my bedroom doing this talk. It's great because I can finish at like 9.30, go down, have a cup of tea before you go to bed. So it's kind of quite nice in a way, but I kind of miss that real interaction of actually seeing people. And if you crack a joke, you can't really see anyone on Zoom, you know, nodding or laughing. You just don't see it. You're just in your bedroom, you crack a joke and thinking, did that work? Is that work? I don't know. But now we've gone to the next level here, and I'm doing a talk to real people here, but on a screen down here in front of me, there's like people on Zoom as well. So it's kind of, this is another another level. So hats off to the Berkshire Bar Ornithological um, Club that you've actually managed to kind of put, kind of link the two things together. But anyway, um, so as I've been introduced, my name's David Wilding. I'm the site manager on our board. Um, I've been there for 17 years. Um, can I just see the people in the room, show of hands, how many people have been to our board? It's pretty much most of the people here. There's a few people who haven't put their hands up. And one of my jobs tonight is the people who haven't put their hand up is to make you think, actually, I want to go to Otmore. Actually, we, let's, let's get in the car and go to Otmore and actually discover what, what this bloke's been talking about and we can see what it's really like. But also, my other aim is for the people who put their hand up is for you to come and say, actually, I want to go back to Otmore. I've been there for a year. I've been there for a few months. Actually, I'm going to jump in the car and go and have a look. Um, so that's kind of some of my aims tonight. But basically, I'm going to chat to you about the history of the war. They're going to talk to you about how RSPB got involved and about the creation work. Um, then I'm going to kind of take you through the seasons and the kind of different wildlife that's found there and kind of some of the things that we do throughout the year whilst managing a site like our war. OK, so we'll just press on. So just to help you, Jockey, those of you who don't know where our war is, basically this is the map. You see southern England down here, the island right down the bottom and up the top. Just up there, there we are, that's Otmore. So we're, we're here at the moment, we're in Reading. So we're just, just north of Reading, right next to Oxford. It's crazy to think actually, we're only, you know, a few miles outside of Oxford, and yet there is this incredible kind of wetland oasis, literally just a few miles outside. But let's talk about the history. So this is Otmore in the early 1800s, okay? And it was basically, it's a big clay basin, okay? There's, there's the soil down here is literally meters and meters and meters of clay soil. When it rains, if you dig a hole in the water, if it rains, it just fill up the water and we have to sit there. It won't flow through the soil or anything. So it's deep clay soil. To the north, at the top up there, you've got the river Ray that drains in, and the rain drains a lot of Buckinghamshire. And a lot of the rain, when it falls on Buckinghamshire, it kind of goes into the Ray, and then it flows down um, into Oxfordshire and then floods into Otmore. As the Ray exits out the western side of the moor over here, um, you've got high ground either side. So what that means is when we have flood, that literally like we had yesterday, you know, that torrential rain we all had yesterday, it's kind of split into the rivers, it then flows down into the rivers, it hits this basin, and because it's high ground here, it just spreads out and floods this basin. So that's that's kind of how what war works, this big clay basin, big area. But back in the early 1800s, the locals that lived around the moor, the seven towns around the edge of the moor, they um, they basically had what was known as common in rights. So they could uh, they could go down and cut firewood. They could put their animals out there, they put large numbers of geese out there and stuff like that. They could even shoot wildfowl out there. And there's records of them shooting bitten on our walk and selling them in the Oxford marketplace, which is crazy to think of today, but that's that's what they did back there. Um, they had this comedy rights, and it's quite a wild place. And I know calm. I'd love to go back in time and really see what Otmore was like back there. And it would just be an incredible experience to see really how wild it was. But moving the clock forward to about the 1830s. Okay, and a chap called Alexander Croak, he decided that he was going to try and um, drain the moor and kind of put it under the active enclosure, which meant, which meant that they took away the common rights from the local people and richer people around the area could pay money 
to pay for the drainage, and then also they would end up with only parts of the mall. So they actually divided it up. So they actually put in a what we call the ring, where they, they redirected the river. So we've got the new river ray that comes in at the top there. And then we've got the ring ditch system as well. And the idea was that when it rained, the water kind of went around the edge of the moor and disappeared quickly and kind of went into these ring ditches and kind of flooded off, you know, quickly and kind of kept the moor dry so they could keep their animals out for longer. Um, that was his plan. Um, but the local people were not up for this, and um, there's some very famous known kind of old riots, and it's where the local people kind of rioted, um, they would rip up all the hedgerows that were planted, they would try and pull down the drainage um, ditches and try and block them up and stuff like that. Um, so there's a famous hot war riots and they kind of were taken into Oxford and then they escaped and kind of they brought in various soldiers to try and catch them. But they tried really hard to stop it, but it actually did happen, a lot more was drained. But the, 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 the interesting part of the story, and I often think it's the fun part of the story, is that it actually didn't work that well. The moor still flooded. It's a very low-lying flat area anyway. It still flooded. And actually, the chap, Alexander Croak, that actually did all the original drainage stuff, he actually died of all that. And um, he didn't make loads of money out of it or anything. But we'll move the clock forward now. And um, we're now talking about kind of actually pre-war time, about 1938, the MOD actually purchased a large part of the Otmore Basin. And the reason they bought it was to practice uh, dropping their bombs. So it's about 1938, they were kind of, you know, playing to time to learn about, you know, dropping bombs and getting more accurate. So they acquired a large chunk of Otmore. And then during the Second World War, they actually put lights out in the center of Otmore. And the idea was to direct the German bombers to drop their bombs on the middle of Otmore and not on the factories, the really important factories in Oxford. And uh, there's a story I read about um, a while ago, which basically said some evacuees come out from London and they kind of come out and they lived in some of the villages around the you know, Basin. And apparently after a couple of nights of all the bombing going on, they actually went back to London because they felt safer. <laughs> that's, that's a fantastic story. And actually, this picture here shows you, this is a, one of the bombs that we've, we've uncovered whilst we've been working on the war. So um, moving the clock forward now, we're in the 1960s, 1970s, and this was when the government were doing a big push for self-sufficiency on food. Um, you know, they wanted us to, you know, not rely on imports and stuff like that and grow our own food. And they were basically looking at draining large areas of the country, kind of focusing on wetland areas, basically draining these areas so we could put them into our own production. A lot more was identified as an area that they wanted to drain. Um, it's kind of a big clay basin. Um, so they basically, to do that, they put in these drainage pumps, there's electric drainage pumps, which were put in around the moor. Um, here we are, all these stars here showing you the drainage pumps. And actually all this brown hash area on the map here, this is all the areas of Otmore, Otmore which were actually drained. And they put big flood banks around the edge, so when the rivers flood, it couldn't go in from the outs, kind of in from the edge. Um, and then they had these drainage pumps that just turned on automatically. Um, there's our like clay pipes putting under the soil and all sorts of ditches were dug. And as soon as the water reached a certain height, the pumps would just turn on like that and it would pump the water out and basically they'd keep it dry for kind of animal farming. And to be honest with you, about, about over a third of the moor was actually drained in this way. And this probably had the biggest impact on our moor and the wildlife on our moor. Um, it really, 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 really did kind of change the character of the moor. Um, but it's important to say at this point is that we do not blame the farmers that did this. You know, they were being encouraged to do it, you know, by the government, they were being incentivized to do it. And very much what we were doing during that period of our, of our history, really. So, you know, it was just, it was just what was done. And it's been done everywhere as well. Now moving on to this stretch of road here now. I'm sure probably everyone in this room recognises this stretch of road and we're all driven on it. This is the M40 motorway. It's doing the cutting through Chilton to Aston Rowan. Um, and basically during the early kind of early 80s when they were kind of working their route out for the M40, they actually decided to put it right through the middle of the hot wall. Now, at the time, the local people again kind of uprising to like, we do not want the, the motorway to go right through the middle of our moor. Um, and that's obviously the local people who didn't want it there. But a lot of environmentalists were still saying, you know, we, we don't we don't want this this motorway to kind of go through go through the middle of our moor. Um, and actually what happened was that because there was, although a lot of the moor had been drained, there were still some really important wildlife areas down there. And the local um, Friends of the Earth group in Wheatley, they actually bought a meadow. And um, they, they bought this field and they called it Alice's Meadow. And this is linked to Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice with a Looking Glass, and apparently talked about the patchwork quilt and apparently got his inspiration from all those patchwork fields on, on the Otmore Basin. Um, so they called it um, Alice's Meadow. And basically, that field, they um, sold off pieces of it to people. So you could buy it up, it's about a pound or something like that. 
and they kind of divided it all up. So everyone in this room would own it. And then you would turn around and say, well, actually, I'm going to sell it to my brother, or I'm going to sell it to my sister, and they would buy it with my friends. And it ended up thousands and thousands of people owned a little piece of Alice's Meadow. And the story goes that basically if, if the highways agency or whoever it was at the time were going to put the mall through, put the motorway through the middle of this, this field, they would have to deal with compulsory purchase with every single individual owner of that meadow. Um, now, whether that did change the course of the M40 or not, we'll probably never know, but you can see the M40 doesn't go through or, or it skirts around the edge. And um, but I, I just I just think it's, it's a wonderful story. And there, there is the, the story I've been told since then is they actually changed the law to stop that from happening in the future so you couldn't do it again in the future. Uh, but it's just a wonderful story of, of kind of how Otmore kind of, you know, really kind of got people passionate and stuff like that. So I'm now showing you a picture of Ramsey Island. And, um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because RSPB got, got involved in Otmore or started to think about a place like Otmore in about 1995. Now, at this time, the RSPB was saying we wanted more nature reserves. We wanted more land. You know, we wanted to expand what we had. But the problem was we were buying places like Ramsey Island which are really, really nice wildlife areas, you know, such a special scientific interest and stuff like that. But these type of places didn't come on the market very long, but very, very often. So, um, so basically we had to change our policy of land acquisition. And we made a very radical step and we decided that we were gonna search for pieces of land that had been destroyed and we we're gonna turn them back to their former glory. Now, I say that now, sat here in 2022, and there's so many stories of that happening, you know, across the country. But back in 1995, this was revolutionary stuff. You know, to actually say we wanted to buy a wheat field and turn it back to a wetland would be like, you know, everyone was kind of like, do we really want to do this? Are we prepared to do this? But, you know, as an organization, they said, no, we want to do this. This is what we want to do. If we want more land, we need to turn it back from where it's been destroyed and turn it back to these kind of, um, these, these incredible wildlife areas. So they did a study up and down the country. A lot more was identified as one of the top five sites that they thought, actually, we could do this. On. Um, our sites are identified, and you know, these are well known wildlife areas now. Lake and Heath, which is the famous carrot fields. Um, you've got Ham Wall or the Avalon Marshes down in Somerset, which are obviously the peak extraction areas down there. Um, so these are kind of areas that we were focusing on at that time. We bought these fields at that time. So why were we interested in Otmore? Well, this is showing you kind of the, the contour map of, of the Otmore Basin. It's exactly as I described it earlier. You've got the high land, you know, around to the south. And basically just this big flat clay basin, very low line land which floods. But a critical bit is there's no like, villages, there's no towns, there's no living in the middle there. So it's like this big area of land. You know, it's about 1,400 hectares in size. So this is this is a big sizable area of land. So that was important. You know, when we're looking at reserve acquisitions, we want big areas of land. The other thing, which is really important as part of you know why we were interested, is this chunk of land in the middle here, this red area. And this is the MOD firing range. So although the MOD owned a large chunk of oil, they actually sold a lot of it off, you know, kind of at the end of the war and stuff like that. Um, but they retained a, a chunk in the middle and it's actually a rifle range. And they, they, they shoot their bullets down the bottom of here, but they need this big bit of the back here in case they miss the targets and the bullets go wide enough behind. Um, but anyway, that, that was retained as an MOD firing range. And like all MOD land in this country, it's brilliant for wildlife. Um, you know, you've got the Lower Earth Ranges, the, Sal the Salisbury Plains, you know, you can name the, the, these incredible areas where, where they haven't been intensively farmed, they've just been used for troops to run across and shoot guns and stuff like that. Um, but actually the wildlife has kind of remained there. Um, so we, we knew that the wildlife that we were interested in, particularly the wet grassland wildlife, things like the lapwing, the red shank, snipe and the curlew, they were already nesting on these fields. So if we could acquire any of these kind of brown areas, they literally just had to fly over a hedgerow and join our fields. So that, that's quite a key bit. So in about 96, we started to write to local landowners and we said, look, is anyone interested in selling? And in 1997, a chap said, actually, I'll sell. You know, it's getting expensive to farm these fields. You know, the price of energy was going up, the pumps and the electricity. He actually felt it was better to sell, really. That, that, was, that was what he, um, he decided to do. And this is what we bought. This is the, so as you know of more, as you head, head along the main track and you get to that double metal gate and you look outwards, this is the greenway field. So this is it here. As we bought it, it was literally just a wheat field. And actually that, that photo I showed you of the combine earlier, that was it taking the, that was actually the greenway field when they were taking the wheat crop off just before we acquired it. 
So that was literally what we started with, was this, this one arable field. And then from 97 up to about 2005, we gradually added more fields to the more area. Hopefully you can see this on the slide, but basically all this pink area here is basically all now under, under the RSPB management. And we're now managing over 461 hectares. Now for Southern England, that is a big reserve. You know, that is a sizable reserve and, you know, it really, it's really exciting that we kind of got this big chunk of land where, which we're kind of, you know, managing um, for wildlife. So what type of habitats are we actually managing on Otmore? What have we tried to create there? Well, the, one of the main ones is actually wet grassland and exactly what it is. I think the fancy word is floodplain grazing marsh. It's literally wet grassland. It's grassland that floods, floods in the winter and in the spring it gradually dries down in the summer it's quite dry and then come autumn and winter again it then floods again and we used to have about I think it's about 1.2 million hectares of wet grassland across the UK we're now down to about 220,000 hectares so we have lost a serious amount of wet grassland and through the description of what I said at the very start this talk about the arable farming and stuff like that as well we lost it you know, farming or, or development on there as well. There's kind of all sorts of reasons, but it's a really important habitat. And it was a habitat that was already there on Otmore as well. Now, the other habitat we tried to create on Otmore is reed bed. Um, really complementary habitat alongside the um, alongside wet grassland. And we've actually, you know, done a really good job. I've explained a bit more about the reed bed that we created. But again, it's another habitat that's been lost across our country, particularly off the east of England. A um, couple more really important habitats are our hedgerows. Really, really important that when I talked earlier about the parceling up the fields, there's still some really lovely old hedgerows and Otmore, um, which are packed full of, they're mainly black form of hawthorn, predominantly black form of hawthorn, but they're really, really important um, hedgerows on, on the moor. And finally, the other habitat which we're managing for are the hay meadows, species rich hay meadows, and we've got some really, really nice hay meadows, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more later on. So I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about kind of some of the problems we've had. So we, we bought these fields and, you know, and I'm, I'm quite an honest person. Whenever I talk to people, I tell the truth, I say exactly as it is. But we bought these fields, we went in and we thought, you know, oh, we're going to do this, we do this. And actually we made loads of mistakes because we were learning. We were learning on the ground, you know, we'd never done this before. So we made loads of mistakes. We had, had to deal with a lot of issues, which probably at the start we didn't really think we'd have to worry about. But one of them was bomb disposal. Because obviously, I explained earlier, it was used for um, bombing practice in the Second World War. Um, basically, we had to deal with the unexploded ordnance, which is still on the board. You know, we're still uncovering it to this day. Um, and it's quite interesting. In the early days, it was quite easy because we would, the way it was dealt with, health and safety probably wasn't as strict as it is now. And we would literally just like, say, OK, well, we know there's unexploded ordnance. Just tell the bigger drivers, just keep your eye out. And if we come across anything, we'll just phone the MOD out and they'll come and deal with it. <laughs> It worked, nobody got injured, it was fine. It was just how we did it back then. But then as time progressed and health and safety become stricter, we had to do it differently. We had to kind of bring in um, companies that would have to do a whole sweep of the field kind of using their, their, their kind of metal detectors to look for any ferrous objects and stuff like that. Um, and there's one particular field we were doing, um, I brought this firm in and then they swept the whole field and they said they'd come across something like 3,000 metal objects in this field. And I was like, what do we have to do with that? I said, oh, well, we have to go in and check each of them to see whether it's, it's a bomb or something. I was like, oh, no, you know, that's going to cost a fortune to have to dig at each individual. And so um, I, I worked it out with them. And we were only going to search the areas where we were digging the bombs. And the bits outside of that we were going to leave alone. So anyway, so they came down and they started to dig, dig these holes and, and look for stuff. And then I got this phone call. And I'm like, oh, David, we've got one. Oh, OK, I'll come down. They come down and show me. They're kind of uncovered. And they've got just this tip of this big looking bomb. And, um, and I said, well, what do you have to do now? I said, we have to phone the police. And I said, don't just phone the bombs. No, no, you go to the police first. So we phone the police and then the police come down and they look at it and they're like, yeah, it's a bomb. That's a bomb. <laughs> Even though I've got kind of, you know, experts in it that told me it's a bomb, they said it's a bomb. So the next thing they say, oh, now we get the army out. So then they got the army out and um, these chaps, apparently there's a bomb dis disposal unit in um, Didcot, um, which is quite close to us. But for some reason, I don't understand, but they sent these guys who come all the way over from Cambridgeshire. And the thing is, this truck only does about 40 miles an hour. And I was just like, oh, we're going to have to wait ages for them to turn up. So eventually they turned up and they were kind of like looking at it and they're thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, you know, that, that's a bomb. It looks live. They can see a detonator on the side of it. And we can see some paint markings on it. So it's definitely a live bomb. So we're like, oh, so what do we have to do now? And they were looking at their manuals and they're saying, well, um, 
Mm. I think we're going to need Secretary of State approval to do an explosion because of the damage it was, you know, the explosion above the fly zone. And they needed this kind of this, this state approval because of the aircraft flying over the top. And this was looking at about nine o'clock at night now. It's taken this long to do it. And, um, and, and they were trying to get hold of them to do it. And basically, they couldn't get hold of them. And they're like, well, what, what are we going to do now? They said, well, we're going to have to shut the moor down for the night. But we're going to have to have police stationed all around the moor in case anyone decides to go down there. So I just, oh, I don't know. I'm going to be so unpopular with the local people. But anyway, so, so they did that. They actually um, shut the moor down. And they, um, they literally had the police out all night long out there. We come back in the morning. And, and a different chap come along and, he, and he's just like, right, we're going to do a destination this morning. And I said, oh, have you got the, the approval? And they're like, oh, well, we've looked into that and we only have to phone Oxford Airport. That's all we have to do, so it'll be fine. So I don't know why they changed their mind. They changed their mind. But anyway, they, um, so then they did it and they, they did the first explosion and it made a crack. And the people around me said that didn't sound very good. So we kind of phoned them up and, well, you know, what's the problem? And they're like, well... We don't think it works properly. And the, the chap in his photo here, bless him, it was the first time he had done it. And they kind of all kind of blamed him. He hadn't done it properly. So they said, well, we'll do a second explosion. So they kind of got this stuff together again. And then did a second explosion. It didn't blow the bomb up as it was expected to. Um, and it just made a crack in it again. So then they said, um, well, what we're going to do, we're going to test the explosive stuff inside it to see to see whether it's explosive. You know, so it's got its power outside it. So I was thinking, you know, this band, they must have loads of chemicals and oil in there and that. So how do you do that then? I was, oh, no, we just scrape a bit of that out and we go over to the corner of the field and we get a light on and we find lights on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking, this is exactly what I love all about this stuff, it's amazing. Anyway, they then they then did enough, they had to wait for more of them carrying up to explosions, so they had to bring more explosives from Cambridgeshire over again to do this. I'm getting about mid-afternoon now or the next day. Um, and eventually they, they blow it up properly. But during this time, somebody had discovered looking in an American bomb manual. That the bomb that was dropped was a dummy bomb it was full of concrete oh, but it just had a detonator on it because they wanted to practice dropping it with detonators on i come to this job to do conservation <laughs> i never thought i was going to be dealing with bomb disposal and stuff like that but uh, but that, that's one of the problems um i must move press on um archaeology we've come across quite a few um roman remains and stuff like that on on the site so we've had to bring an archaeologist um you know it's quite expensive you get these really cool kind of bits and pieces, broken pots and stuff like that. So that, that's really good fun. And then the final biggest challenge we have has been the odd more clay. Oh my word, the odd more clay is something else. Um, in the early days, the contractors, when we were pricing up the jobs and kind of bringing all these big machines to dig all these ponds and scrapes, you know, they, they would look at us and they would say, oh yeah, we'll come down and do that job in the winter because they saw it as a bit of easy money in the winter. And they, they would come down and they would bring their machinery down and, um, my word, it was horrendous. If you had a really wet winter, it was just a mud bath. I mean, this field here, this is the Ashgrove field, actually, called. This is one, you know, the high we've got when you look out in front. This was that field. Um, and it just rained and rained some winters, and they had to bring these special track dumpers. And, and this is just like porridge, you know, this is just porridge, you know, it's just slushy mud. Um, and it, it just took them years to do it. And then we learned lessons in that. And then now, whenever I bring a machinery on site, I say you're coming on in July and you're off in October, and that's it. But you know, a lot of contractors have learned a lot of lessons dealing with one. Whereas I say, let's keep coming back year after year to try and try and finish off the job. But this is what we've created. Um, I'm sure many of you who visit it. You know, it is incredible what's actually been created on these arable fields, and I, I love the aerial photo a lot more because when you walk along, just to get your bearings, you've got the reed bed at the top here. And then this is the high is down here, and this is one of the bridal ways you can walk along. But when you walk along the footpaths around Lot more, I don't think people really quite realise how much water there is out there on site. Um, because it's a flat site, you can just see the grassland and the tall grass around there. You don't quite appreciate just how many kind of wet features, ponds, ditches that we've dug. Um, and I also I quite like this picture because it shows the kind of different areas that we've done the work on as well. Because you know, this is the deep ditches that we dug in the early days, which were too deep and two high banks and weren't very good for wildlife. Then we went to America to bring this machine called the Rotary Ditcher over. So then we started to dig these drains here and we started to get, you know, these lovely kind of straight drains and they kind of spread the material out to the side and create these, these lovely ditches. But then as we got better, we actually aimed to create these type of features. You know, actually it was the technology advanced, we could use GPS and kind of leveling things and all sorts 
and basically create these, these lovely intricate features that look a lot more natural. So it's almost like you can take out the different eras that we've been working on on the field. So, oh, that one we've done in that year, that one we've done in that year. You can kind of pull it out together. But anyway, so that's the wet grass and areas we've done. Now I'm going to chat to you about the reed bed. Okay, it's a very old, excuse the graininess of the picture, but this is, this is an old slide photo. Um, now the, the reed bed is actually a genius idea. So when we bought the first field, we did what was known as a water budget calculation. So we worked out how much rainfall we were going to get, how much evapotranspiration was going to happen, and we're going to kind of work out where we're going to have enough water to keep the field wet enough in the springtime. And we realised we weren't going to have enough water. So we said, well, why don't we build a reservoir? So that's actually what we did. We've got a reservoir in, we've got a north and south reservoir. But the genius part about it was somebody said, let's not just make it an open water reservoir, let's turn it into a reed bed. Because it's a really complementary habitat with the wet grassland. But the clever part about it was we were able to access EU money, money funding to pay for the reed bed creation. Because basically it was a um, you know it's a habitat that they wanted to work on at the time, really um, declining habitat. So we were able to access this money and we were able to bring it in. We also worked um, with the Environment Agency, they were brilliant in the early days, kind of helping us with the design stuff and helping support us on, on, on that side of it as well. And that's what we created was this, this, this um, reservoir or reed bed. So, here we go. Once we um, created all the islands, we then had a polytunnel in the corner of the reserve and we grew reeds. This is all the reed seedlings that we grew. And then we got the local community to come out with little, um, they'll come out with their dibbers and they would plant the reed in little pop, you know, kind of plugs and plug it all the way along. And it was amazing. You get this incredible line of reed. It was really great. The whole community would come out and do it. But then the next day would come out and the whole lot being grazed by the geese. <laughs> and it was like, oh, it, 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 was, it was real hassle it was. But um, we devised methods. So this is the lines of reeds you can see here. But we ended up putting nets around them to stop the geese and the, the, the uh, coots and that from basically grazing the vegetation of it. So we've got plant, plant this line of reed and be really, really quick. You can do that in about half an hour. But you'd then spend about the next two or three hours trying to put the nets up around you to protect it. And you have to go back again and check it. Hadn't found their way in and stuff like that. Really, really intensive management. We planted 150,000 reed plugs. It took us seven years, but we've ended up with this reed bed. And I'm sure you know many of you have seen the reed bed. Um, you know, you know, as you look out from the viewing screens. Um, in the early, you know, only a few years ago, I could walk from from this end of the reed bed to the other really easily. Now it's almost impossible. The reed is so thick, it's so dense, it's so built up with litter as well. It's amazing. It's like this really incredible habitat that we've created. And just, just put your mind back, this was an arable field. You know, 20 odd years ago, this had wheat and barley grown on it. And now it's a reed bed. And I, I just, you know, I, I keep having to say that to myself sometimes when I look at it. And I, you know, I was, I was down there down there yesterday, a couple of days ago, and glossy ibis just flew over the top of it. And you just like, saw a glossy ibis, then I saw a crane, and then I saw a bittern. Literally, all in the same day. It's just like, my work, this is Oxfordshire, this is an arable field. And that's what we've created. It is amazing. So that's that's the creation stuff. And I, forgive me, if, if you thought you were going to come to this talk today, and you're just going to hear me talk about all the birds of Otmore. I think you can't talk about Otmore without talking about its history and the creation work that's gone on there. I think it's really important that you understand what's gone on and the work that's gone on with it. So I'm now gonna, now gonna chat to you about, um, about the, take you through the seasons, basically, and kind of the jobs we do, but also some of the, some of the uh, wildlife that we experience whilst, whilst we're working on our horse. So okay, we're gonna start in winter, this is January time. And actually the very first survey we do on our in the year is actually a butterfly survey. Yep. January, we're, we're doing a butterfly survey. And actually what we've got, we've got a group of volunteers here from Butterfly Conservation, and they actually come down and they look for brown hair streak eggs. So as I said earlier, our hedgerows are really important, particularly with the black fawn in them. And we've got black and brown hair streak butterflies, um, which, which love the black fawn. Um, and they're actually looking for the brown hair streak egg. And you can see it here, it's a photo of it. They lay in the fork of the branch, and they're literally looking for this tiny little pinhead of an egg. Um, this is the butterfly here that we're talking about now. These hair streaks, hair streaks give me a bit of a headache because the brown hair streak like really young black fawn and a few years old, whereas the black hair streak like black fawn is about 20 years old. And I've got to try and meet the needs of both of them. And, and that, that's just the story of my life. You know, I've got one bird that likes short vegetation and I've got another bird that likes tall vegetation. And this is what we're always doing. We're kind of trying to just get this 
And the simple way of what we do is just create a mosaic. You know, we try and get a mixture of ages so we can try and meet the needs of everything. But um, as I say, it's a beautiful butterfly, the brown hair tree. Um, so a lot of the work we're doing in the winter time is thorn coppicing. Um, as I said, we've got a lot of hedgerows, but we're doing the thorn coppicing to kind of vary the ages of the, of the black thorn, particularly, so we can meet the needs of things like the, the brown hair streak butterflies. And we just don't have like this monoculture of just hedgerow all the same age. But we, we, we're talking 20 year rotation coppice, 30 year rotation coppice. Um, you know, very, very long periods, but we just take out a section and then we'll take out the next section and then the next section. So some of the birds that can be seen around a lot more in the winter. So it is brilliant for, for birds of prey, raptors. So we've got the kestrel, um, we've got sparrowhawks, peregrines. We've got two peregrines around at the moment, which have shown really, really well and very visible. And we do get merlin. Most year we have merlin on site as well. Um, quite difficult to spot the merlin because obviously they're very small birds, they fly very low. Um, you know, we've got to be quite lucky to pick them up, but, but we do get them a lot more. So some of the other birds of prey that we get a lot more, um, barn owl, um, regularly I saw barn owl literally yesterday, was out hunting quite a lot. Um, we've got ringtail here, hen harrier. Um, again, every winter we have hen harrier on our wall. Um, short-eared owl, they've been around some years. When it's a good year, we can have, you know, large numbers of short-eared owls, short-eared owls. Um, but this, you know, most years we normally just get one or two. And again, you've just got to be patient. They are, they are around hunting on the grassland areas. Um, and then marsh harrier as well. Um, which are a resident bird a lot more. And um, it, it's crazy to think actually, when I when I started a lot more 17, 17 years ago, when we got Marsh Harrier, but, oh, it's a Marsh Harrier, let's go down and see it. Marsh Harrier is a resident bird there now. It's there all year round. Pretty much every time I go down to Walmart, I will see a Marsh Harrier. And again, it's just this, that's amazing. Marsh Harrier, Oxfordshire, centre of England. Absolutely incredible. I'll talk a bit more about their breeding later though. I wasn't talking about too much about them now. Um, so now we're moving into spring. Um, and, and it's important to talk about what more. You know, I mentioned butterflies as well. But it's not just about the birds. You know, we're not just managing the site for birds. You know, we do have a lot of other incredible wildlife there. And um, we have a really good brown hair population. Um, and, you know, again, you know, you go in there in March time and you've got the boxing going on. You know, and I'm sure many of you know boxing is... It's not the males fighting each other, it's actually the female fighting the males who are showing too much attention and she's trying to find the strongest and the fittest mate. Um, it's actually the females doing the boxing, but you can see this a lot more. If you go down there, you can see, see the, the brown hairs kind of chasing each other around and boxing. It's just relentless. Sometimes I really feel for the females, it's just non-stop. Um, but, it, but it's a great spectacle to see. And we've got a population, probably about 40 or 50 hairs down in the more Basin. And, you know, they're, 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 they're their population does go up and down and they are impacted by flooding i would say definitely when we get a total flood situation you know we do do think that they suffer from that but but you know they are doing very well you know they do do recover so moving now into kind of the, the breeding season and i'm going to chat to you a bit more about some of the the wading birds that we got on site so <coughs> excuse me i'm just going to start with the red shank um we call it like a sentinel of the weather i've heard, heard it described and it's kind of like when we're going down there you know on a, and at kind of mid-April morning, there's a mist across the moor. And, you know, the first bird that always seems to see you is the red shank. And it does that piping call that it does. And it always, it just always spots you early on, the red shank. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. And again, you know, I keep saying this, but red shanks breeding in Oxfordshire, you know, it is quite amazing. They don't, the only place they're breeding, actually, they have just started to breed now in Buckinghamshire on the bee barrel side, actually, um, Gallows Bridge, which is really, really exciting. And for us, that's amazing success. That's what we want to see is the red shank spread out across the upper tent tributary. But, but, you know, to have the red shank breeding it is absolutely fantastic. Um, one of my favourite birds on the whole basin is the curlew. And um, again, it's this, this bubbling call of the curlew, you know, that misty, misty kind of mistiness drifting across the field. And you just hear that eerie sound of the curlew bubbling call. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, and another lot more favourite is the snipe. Um, now, the snipe are incredible. They make a drumming sound. How many people in this room have heard a snipe drum? Just put your hand up. That's pretty good, actually. That is pretty good. Those of you who haven't heard it, I really recommend you should get out and try and hear a drumming snipe. Now, the way they make this dropping sound is actually with these side feathers here. Okay, and what they'll do is the males that predominantly do it, and they'll fly up really, really high, and then they'll drop down. And as they drop down, their tail feathers make a vibrating kind of drumming sound. 
I'm going to say this, it's actually shocking, it sounds nothing like it, but it just to give you a bit of an idea. So they kind of fly out up high like this, and they go, doo -doo 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 -doo, and then they go up again, doo -doo 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 -doo. And, and it's the most eerie sound. And I've had people come to me or, or, and just say, I've had this most weird sound, I don't know what it is. And then they described it, and I said, that's from the snipe. Um, and, and again, snipe are really important on all, because we've got, we hold the population on our wall. Um, we've got between about 20, 20 drummers or so on the on your basin. The nearest breeding snipe to us, all the way over in Cambridgeshire, or all the way down in sunset levels, or down in the New Forest, that's how far away. And we're literally the block in the middle. And we've got about 20 drummers there. There's like no pressure on me to keep them, <coughs> honestly. But it is amazing that they are there and we have got a growing population. We've done a lot of work for science to try and understand them. So, move on, just grab a glass of drink of water now. I'm sure everyone in this room recognises this bird, it's the lapwing. We've got a really good population of lapwing on the other base and they have kind of fluctuated and gone up and down. Um, I've done a lot of research work on lapwing as well. Um, and what we found was in the early days, when we first bought the fields and we kind of wetted them up, the population went, it was quite low and it suddenly shot up to like over 100 pairs. And then the population absolutely crashed and it kind of, you know, numbers went down. So we decided as part of, and this wasn't just on our wall, this was happening on lots of RSVP sites and a lot of the newly created sites that we were buying. Um, so we actually decided to do some research on them to try and find out, and it's happening across the country. And we basically um, put up nest cameras so all the way over here, you can see the nest camera at the far end here. And just looking down, and here's the lapwing nest, which is just there. Okay. So we put these put these um, cameras up on the nest, and this is the images that we picked up. Boxes, kind of expect that one, but also badgers. And badgers actually turned out to be quite a major predator on our moor, particularly when it's a dry year. It feels like the badgers head down onto the moor because the ground wetter is easier for them to dig out earthworms and stuff like that. Um, and, and it's quite self-destroying because what happens, we put this camera on the nest and it watches the nest and it, you know, everything's fine and we go and change the batteries and change the cards and we go and double check that the nest doesn't be predated and everything's fine. And it's not until the egg starts to hack, break, kind of the chicken side starts to break out and as it kind of cracks the egg and it starts to make a chipping sound. And the problem is the foxes hear it and they'll just make a beeline to it and they just gobble up all the eggs. So our poor old assistant warden, Andrew, he will like spend, you know, about three weeks kind of monitoring this nest and getting really excited. Oh, it's getting close and nearly close to hatching. We count the days down, we know it's going to hatch. And then he goes out there and like, the whole nest has just been gobbled up literally in the last, you know, when he knew it was literally that day it was going to hatch. Um, so it's, it's quite sad. It, it does happen, you know, it does happen a lot. But when you do turn up, so a nest cup, and you've got this, it's amazing. This little cup of these beautiful chicks. You know, you just see little heads here, one here, one there, another head up there, and another over there. It's just this ball of fluff. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so we, we have done a kind of a lot of work with the lapwing and trying to find out more. We haven't just done lapwing. We've also done um, snipe as well. So this is a little snipe chick here. And the snipe are quite cool, actually, because the snipe, the lapwing are easy. To find a lapwing nest, they literally just lay it in the middle of the field and you can kind of sit around the edge of the field and you can see the lapwing sat down and then you can kind of walk out to it and find the nest quite easily. The problem is that the snipe, they just stay sat on the nest and they will not move. And their nest is hidden in a, in a, in a clump of brush or a tussock of grass or something like that. They just stay hidden. And the, nest, the snipe won't come off the nest and so you literally want to step on it and then it suddenly flies up. So, um, so we've got a method that we use to kind of search for them. Um, we kind of drag the rope along and watch and we see the snipe fly up and stuff like that. That's how we find them. But we thought we'd put a camera on the nest and we were one of the first reserves to actually put a camera on a snipe nest. So we kind of found the snipe nest and we put the camera there and we were like quite excited. We kind of tease the grass either side and put the camera lens just onto the nest so we could see it. And then we went away and then we come back and thought we'll change the camera card and go and have a look and see what happened. And we put the camera card into our computer and basically as we um, as we kind of downloaded it and watched it, we were watching the nest, nest and suddenly we noticed that the, the female actually just pulled the grass in front of the camera so we couldn't actually see anything inside. <laughs> absolutely fantastic it was. Um, but anyway, I mean, snipe are fascinating creatures, absolutely fascinating because basically what happens is the female sits on the nest the whole time um, and the male just disappears. But when the eggs hatch, 
the male comes back and will take two of the chicks away, and then the female will take the other two chicks away. Um, and it's statistically proven that the male is actually better at kind of getting the chicks to fledge in than the female is. And it's probably because he's done absolutely nothing for about four weeks while she's been sat on the nest. But, um, but it's quite fascinating. But anyway, so we've done some work on the snipe to try and discover a bit more about them. Actually, this is a this is one of the flesh chicks that we've come across. When we're searching for a nest, we actually come across this flesh chick as well. It's absolutely amazing. Beautiful, beautiful birds. So that's the snipe. Now let me talk to you about curlew. I said earlier about kind of, I just absolutely love the curlew. But what we noticed on our population graphs of the curlew, kind of, we changed the lap wing trend and they went up. The red shank, they went up. We adjusted water levels in the last few years and we've managed to get the snipe to go up. But the curlew just stayed very low, didn't really change at all. Um, and we wanted to find out what was going on with the curlew. So we, we did similar again, we kind of went out and looked for the nests and they are really hard to find. We talk about kind of snipe nest, we've got a simple methodology that helps. Lapwing nests are easy to find, but curlew, although it's a really big bird, it's actually really difficult to find a curlew nest. So it's taken us a lot of time, kind of, kind of a lot of practice to get there, but we've basically been able to kind of locate the curlew nest. We put the cameras on the curlew nest, and we discovered, we knew what we were going to find, but it was important we still made sure what we were expecting, you know, to prove what we thought was going to happen. And we had the boxes and the badgers come in to take the, the eggs again. So um, what we decided to do, the rest of the reserve, I must say, the reason we managed to recover kind of the red shank and the lapwing population is that we actually put a big predator fence up around one of our fields, about 40 hectare field, and actually that recovered the population. That kept out the boxes and the badgers. Um, but the problem is with the curlew, they kind of nest more individually. They're not a big group within a big field. Um, they're kind of spread out across them all. So we discovered this method in, in they were using in Holland and Germany, where you find a nest and you literally, a 25 meter square, you put this electric fence up around it to kind of protect it. And it's only got to be up to three weeks, three to four weeks, and then you take it down again. Um, so we put this, this fence up around the nest and we're fortunate enough, um, we've already proven it now that actually, um, you know, the, the nests that we fence are much more successful, and actually the hatching success is is is, is probably a sat about seventy or eighty percent. It's absolutely superb. So the fencing has actually really worked quite well. And actually, last year, last spring, um, we've got about sixteen pairs of curlew in the Ottawa Basin. We actually managed to fledge about nine chicks, and that is a really really good figure. Trust me, for curlew. Um, that is a really, really good figure to get nine chicks, and um, you know part of the reason of that is because we do the do the fencing around it. But we also um, we were, we were getting the success of the curly chicks, and we've actually gone from six six fledged chicks to seven fledged chicks to nine fledged chicks. So again, we're kind of getting better. But we wanted to find out a bit more information about our curly chicks, so we decided to link up with a local ringer. And, um, and we actually, and we part of a part of a ringing scheme, and we actually put some yellow flags on some of the curly chicks that we found. Now, then we can't put them on when they're very young, we have to wait for them to be a certain age. And then we've got to try and find these curly chicks in this long grass. It's really, really quite difficult, but I'm sure a lot of you have been watching Autumn Watch and seen the, the stuff about Jack Sniper, the thermal imaging camera and stuff like that. That's actually what we've been using to help us locate these chicks. So we were able to, um, to actually bring three chicks last spring, which is amazing. So I want to introduce you to Pepper. We call this one Pepper after Pepper Saxifrage, the flowers. They're all going to be named after um, flowers a lot more. So we've got Pepper, we've got Yarrow, and we've got Angelica. Okay, but I'm going to introduce you to Pepper. So it's the P that's the important part. They're all H, but it's the letter at the end which is what changes. So that this bird was, was ringed in, in about um, late June. It hung around the moor. Um, we saw it around the moor um, into August, into early August. And then I got this photograph from a chap who sent me this photo to say, I think we've got your bird. Um, and obviously, you can tell by the rocks there, there's nothing to do with the Ottawa Basin. We don't get rocks like that. Um, it turned out this chap was actually all the way over in County Kerry on the southwest coast of Ireland. So it's about 378 miles away. And it was, as I say, it was last seen on the 4th of August, and then it was picked up on the 21st of August. And it's, it's, it's probably nothing remarkable in the sense of, you know, it's a fresh bird, it's heading to a coastal area, anywhere around the UK you can find curvy feeding. Um, but it is it's still really fascinating for us to, to see where it has gone. And, and the amazing thing is we literally bring three curly chicks 
and yet we managed to get a record straight away. It was really, really exciting. So um, there hasn't been any more records of it, and we'll just have to see. It will take you about two or three years before they'll come back, you know, into the breeding area. So we're just going to keep working on that side of the project and, and doing that. So last slide I'm going to do before we have a little break. Um, this is to talk through our population, and um, this is exactly what I was talking about. Talking the blue line here, the black one, and you can see, you know, we've come here in '97, the black one population shot up, then it plummeted. 2010 was when we put the predator fence in, and you can see what happened. The population shot up, but now we've kind of got it going down again, and we're kind of working on that one at the moment. But it can just show you kind of the impacts with the with the snipe. The snipe are another interesting one. Um, you know, with the bumbling population, it was quite low. And then around about this period here was where we changed our water level management. And what happened was, I was, I was really badgering. I'm quite a persistent person, really. You know, I, I see something like that, I'm not happy about it. I keep pushing and pushing and trying to find the answer. I was really badgering our, our reserves ecologists and some really amazing people who've done all the research on SNIPE in the 80s. And they come down to the reserve and I said, tell me more, tell me more. What have we got to do? What's going on with your SNIPE? And, um, and they basically said to me, Looking at the way you manage your water levels, we traditionally dried our fields out in about July time because we wanted to get a tractor on site that was manageable grass and we were draining them out by about July time because that's where most of the waders are finished nesting and it kind of like fell out the right time to do. But they said, no, actually, the snipe will repeat, repeat breed. So they'll keep um, breeding throughout the year, you know, throughout the, the long season. They'll have multiple roots, basically. Um, and they said that the, the, the critical factor is that the fields need to be remain, remain wet because the female needs to get into conditions that make more eggs, basically. Um, and in order for her to do that, she needs to be able to probe the soil to get all the earthworms. And we were effectively drying out our fields, which were making it less suitable, you know, for that, that long breeding season that's like that. So this is where we found out this around about 2010, 11-ish, we started to keep our fields wetter and you can see how the snipe population responded almost instantly. And it's absolutely amazing. And I love it when you can see something like that. You can see it's dropped off a bit here, but these last couple of years are not, are not accurate records. Um, and various things have gone on. Obviously, we weren't doing proper surveys this year. And then this year, we had some floods and a really bad year for weather anyway for waders. Um, but I suppose I'm more telling you this just for you to understand just how complicated it is and how we're continually looking at things and analysing things and trying to find what the problems are and trying to look at solutions. And it's, it's not easy managing a nature reserve like our war. A lot of work, a lot of thought and a lot of effort goes into it. It's not just me that's doing it. There's a whole team of people that are helping me and supporting you know, us in the background that are kind of feeding into it to kind of help us do it. So I'm going to stop now. Um, it's about kind of roughly half time and um, I think we have refreshments now. Is that right? Yeah, okay, so I'll stop now and then we'll come back. Thank you. Yeah. Right, there we go. So I'll just keep this slide up just quickly because um, one of the things which I said to you about kind of trying to change things and I wasn't happy with the snipe. Okay, there we go. Does that work? Oh, you see, now it doesn't work on there, does it? If you're on that, no, you have to move. Sorry, you have to move over to that screen. Uh oh, oh, crumbs. Wait, then so were they. I think it's over here. Uh, but will they see that That's screen? It. Yes. They do see that screen yes. as well. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So if you look at the curly population, it's kind of bumbling along quite low. Um, this is my mission, basically, or not one now, is to change like, the fortunes of curly. And I want to see that kind of moving upwards and kind of see that going upwards. Um, anyway, so that's that's the way. Does this just press on and chat to you about some of the other species we get down on, on the on the wall? So cuckoos, um, cuckoos are doing really really well, and they're doing really well because we've got a fantastic um, uh, reef wall population, and they're basically using that as a host species. So um, you know, it's really really good to see the cuckoo or a population that's on the increase on your wall basin. Um, how many people heard cuckoo last year? It's just see. Yeah, lots of you heard cuckoo. Now that, that's really, really good. Um, just moving on though, turtle dove. How many of you heard turtle dove last year? Yeah, there's only a hand, you know, a few hands have gone up. Yeah. Oh, did you get one oh, oh, last year? Was that the year before? Oh, last year, oh, it might have been the year before because let me just say, so Otmore used to be a, a real hot spot for, for turtle dove. Everyone would go to turtle dove and and pick them up because there are real places where, where they'll be seen. And you know, every year, turtle dove were there. Um, you know, it's fantastic. You know, we found 
even found the nest location a couple of times, which is absolutely amazing. But last year, tail dove didn't actually turn up on the wall. Um, mm. And it certainly, there may have been, we did have one other potential record, but they certainly didn't breed on the wall last year. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is really sad news, you know, and turtle dove are in dire, dire trouble at the moment. You know, their population is absolutely crashed. I think it's about 95% since the 70s, the population has gone downhill. Um, and, and basically what's happening with the turtle doves, we're getting what we call is the range shrinking. And basically we're Oxfordshire is kind of on the edge of the range and they're kind of gradually moving kind of to the east and to the southeast. And basically they're the hotbeds for turtle dove. But they're basically the range is just shrinking and shrinking. And uh, the RSPB, the RSPB are doing a lot of work with turtle dove at the moment. They've got something called Operation Turtle Dove. And they're trying to do work out what's going on in the breeding grounds and they're trying to provide extra food because they know that food is one of the issues. There's not enough weed seeds around that they used to feed on. Um, so they're kind of doing stuff like that. But they're also working on the flight paths and they're kind of working out that our turtle doves are going across the Spain route and they're kind of they've actually I mean, being agreed they're not going to shoot in Spain this year, which is going to be fantastic. But, um, but basically the turtle dove population is really in trouble, but we are putting everything we can into it. And the, I, I do believe that we can turn it around because you know, we've got a track record of doing this. You know, we've, we've done it with corn crate, we've done it with bittern. You know, when we've got a species that's in decline like this, we can put a lot of effort, a lot of research, and a lot of resources into it. And if we know what the birds want, we can actually try and find solutions. And that, that's what we're doing. So we have lost turtle dove a lot more, and it is really, really sad. I think it was inevitable it was going to happen. But hopefully we can find what needs to be done for them we can start to see that population grow. And, you know, much like it has done with bitterns, you know, another species that we've done the work for. So um, other warblers, we've got 10 species of warbler on, on, the, on the wall. So this is white throat, um, you know, it's Chetty's warbler, black cap, chaff, chaff um, white throat, Nessa white throat, grasshopper warbler, um, you know, I probably missed a couple of black cap garden warbler. You know, we've, we've got 10 species down there and those hedgerows just become alive. You know, it just, you want to test your warbler song come down to what more, you know, you can walk along that hedgerow and you can test your, your reed warblers or your set warblers, your garden warblers from your black caps, you know, it's, we've got the lot and it's a really good place to kind of, you know, really kind of have a go with your warblers. Um, not just the birds, I keep saying it, not just the birds, as we put in all those ponds, those ditches, those wet beaches, things like the toads and the frogs and the newts, the amphibian population has gone through the roof and, and basically you can walk across our paths on kind of on a spring morning and just just um, kind of early summer, and if you get a shower of rain, you have all the little toadlets which are just hopping along, and you're almost tiptoeing through them because they're just like bouncing along or crawling along the path. It's absolutely fantastic. But as as the amphibian populations increase, <coughs> we've also seen the grass snake population rocket. And um, if you do come to Ardmore, we've got these fantastic volunteers. They're called wardens, and their job is to just walk around the site and chat to visitors. You know, they often have a name badge on them. If you see them, have a chat. They often tell you where some of the good birds have been spotted, but they may even show you some really good places to see grass snakes, because basically along that main bridleway area, you call it the bridleway, but one of the main tracks, it slopes down to this edge of reed. And basically in the spring, you can get probably five, six, seven grass snakes all entwined with each other in the reed, and you can just see them basking in the sun. Often if you see a grass snake, it just shoots across the path really quickly and you just get a glance of it. But if you, if you turn up at all at the right time and you just look down there, it's a nice sunny morning, you can just see these grass snakes just basking in the sun. It's absolutely fantastic. But chat to our wardens, you know, they'll direct you in. They're absolutely amazing people. So I kind of moving into kind of spring, going into summer now. This is this is one of the hay meadows. Um, this is actually the MOD land. It's one of the MOD hay meadows. And actually what happened um, a couple of years ago, we actually become tenants on the southern half of the MOD. So we can't open it to the public, you know, just can't do it because it's an MOD firing range. But this hay meadow is one of the best hay meadows in the country. It is absolutely incredible. This is Dyer's Greenweed, absolutely covered in Dyer's Greenweed. Um, earlier in the season, you've actually got a lot of this meadow thistle, and it's actually more purple colour, but then it goes to this yellow colour. It's really species rich. I mean, I've never seen a, a hay meadow like it. I mean, there's hardly any grass on there, and it is all herbs, you know, as I said, guys, green leaves, sneeze worm, meadow thistle, great burnet, you know, it's absolutely packed with flowers, so many different flowers, but there's a really rare flower that's actually found on there. It's called the fen violet, um, and it's a tiny little violet with a very pale 
uh, flower. You know, it's, it's a white flower, basically, but it's this very distinctive leaf shape as well. Now, this fen violet is only found in three places around the country. It's found in Otmore, it's found in Woodwarton Fen and Wickham Fen, so they're kind of over in East Anglia. Um, and that's the only three places it's found in the whole country. On Woodwarton Fen and Wickham Fen, it's not doing particularly well, and it only appears as a disturbed bit of ground. But on Otmore, we've got hundreds and hundreds of the plants, and it's actually doing really, really, really well. Um, now, I'm feeling slightly under pressure, though, because now I've become the site manager of this incredible hay meadow. And it's now my job to make sure we don't lose the benbiner and all the other incredible flowers that are found down there. Um, but I've, been, I've actually bought some new toys this year as well. We're going to get them soon. We've actually bought some hay cutting machinery. So we're actually looking at making our own hay on there because the problem is I've got the local contractors cut the hay for us, but they're really unreliable. And they'll do all the other farmers' hay first. And we're at the bottom of the list because that's just the way it works. And I spent my life chasing them around. So I've had enough. I managed to kind of scribble some money around and get some money. So we've got some hay cutting machinery. So hopefully we'll be getting on and doing some hay cutting, which would be really good fun. Um, this is um, green winged orchids, uh, which are a really important kind of orchid of the, the wet grassland areas, the hay meadows. Now, one of our fields, which is a former arable field, we've actually managed that as a hay meadow. And I was out on this hay meadow um, last summer and I counted, well, this spring actually, the green winged orchid. And I counted about 80 green winged orchids in this in this meadow. And again, I have to say again, 20 years ago, that was an arable field. And now there's 20 green winged orchids which are flowering out there. Now we know, you know, if you know orchids, you know, their, their seeds do spread very easily, but it's still amazing that they have actually established in this hay meadow. Um, it's absolutely fantastic to see all these little purple heads just poking up in the on the grassland. It's absolutely fantastic. Another flower we have, which is this white one here, which is in our ditches, is called the water violet. Um, again, I, I kind of think this one's a bit like a, um, the bluebell of the woodlands, because when it flowers, it literally just takes over the whole ditches and it just appears, all these white flower heads, and then it just disappears again and you can't see it again, it just, it's just there and then it goes. Um, but the important thing about the Otmore ditches are that I talked to you earlier about the flood banks that were dug around the edge by the original farmers. <laughs> well, those banks are still in place. So it means that when we do flood, we don't get a lot of the kind of the polluted water from the River Ray. The River Ray is not the cleanest river in, in, in the country. It's very slow flowing kind of clay soils. But basically it doesn't, all the pollutants don't come onto the reserve. These fields are only fed by rainfall. And obviously rainfall is a lot cleaner than the river that's flowing through. So the water is really good quality water. It's crystal clear. And that's why we have some of these incredible plants. And um, another one we have is the bladderwort, this lovely ye yellow flower. Now the bl bladderwort is quite amazing. Um, it actually is insectivorous and it has these bladders. So you see these bladders here and you can just see there's a mosquito larvae getting sucked in. And these, these kind of um, hairs along the edge of it kind of suck it in as the mosquito larvae went, mosquito larvae went past it kind of sucked it in and then it, it basically digests it so it's an insectivorous plant and it does that because there's not high nutrients in our water it's kind of to get these nutrients um, from the plants which is absolutely amazing so we're now in the middle of summer and that's when these guys come down onto the moor um, we, we graze mainly with cattle, there's a few areas we're grazing with sheep, but we're trying to move predominantly with cattle um, because the way they graze, they tear the grass and the, the big cow pats are full of earthworms and stuff like that. So it's a really important species or, or, or creature that we, we like on the moor. And basically they come down, you know, in the spring and on, into the summer and basically they're out helping us with grazing. Now, this is a really rare picture of our moor um, because it's actually a picture of me and a tractor. Now, I love going out on the tractor, but I hardly ever get out there now because I'm a site manager. I spend my life in the office. I'm doing all the boring spreadsheets and all the dull stuff, but I do occasionally get out on the tractor. Um, and we hire a tractor in to do all the management work, and we'll hire it in from about July. We have it from July through to about October, and we're basically trying to work it from seven in the morning to seven at night, five days a week, to try and get as much work as we can done. Um, so often I do the late shift in the evening, so I'm like volunteer time, it's just the extra time I always go out there and got the lights. It's quite nice about, about September or so, it's, you know, October, it's getting quite dark and you literally top in with the lights and you're going along with all the lights around you and that's really cool. Um, <laughs> but, but we do a lot of tractor work, we don't just cut the grass, we come there, rate it and we kind of, you know, rotate those bits to get rid of the brush as well. So a lot of work goes into this tractor, you know, we really put the hours in, but it's, but it, but it's worth it. To kind of create and it's kind of the pressure is on this time of year the pressure's on because 
We've got this tractor for a set period of time. We've got all this work to do, and we've got to do it before it rains, because as I explained earlier, if it rains, you can't get the tractor on, the soils can't cope with it. So, we, you know, we're really under pressure to try and get as much done as we can in the short time that we've got to do it. But when you're out on the tractor, you know, you get things like the dragonflies, you've got brown walker here, which you kind of, you know, again, we've got, we've got 23 species of dragonfly and damselfly on the reserve, and these are fantastic. These are like the birds that prey at the insect world. And you ever sit by a pond and just watch a hawker just dart, you know, just hawking around, catching insects and eating them. It's absolutely amazing. But what's even better is watching a hobby catching dragonflies. Mm -hmm. That is really special. I mean, we, we can, you can, in the, Right here in spring, you can actually have about 20 or 30 hobbies in the sky over the Ottawa Basin kind of catching insects like this dragonfly. And they'll catch the dragonfly, and you can see this one here, it's just stripping its wings off and kind of drops them and it eats it. It's just as it's doing it in flight. And they're like up and down, acrobat, starting around. Absolutely stunning birds of prey, really amazing to watch. Um, I've mentioned earlier with butterflies, there's 34 species of butterfly. We've got a common blue hill, some lovely crested. Pressed dog style um, grass stem here. Um, so again, you know, really, really good for butterflies. And now we're moving into autumn. And again, talking about these hedgerows, you know, that's when their hedgerow colour starts to change. Um, and then they start to become packed full of berries. And this is where you'll pick up things like the red wings and field birds that kind of come in and start feasting on the berries. And it's interesting, what I noticed in Ottawa is they'll go into the hedgerows first, they'll strip them bare of the, the slows and the haws and stuff like that. And then they kind of move down into the grassland and then they're actually feeding more on the grassland areas. They kind of, but they strip the berries first. Um, but it is, you know, the, the hedgerows are just packed full of all these berries. It's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, and in the autumn time as well, we have quite a few um, passage waders that drop in and we try and manage our water levels in the reef bed. We're kind of getting better at this. Um, and the last few years we've really done it well for snipe and you can get really good numbers of snipe. Any guess of how many snipe are here? Anyone want to shout out in the room? How many? How many? 12, not bad. Anyone else? 11. 15? Yeah, it's 11. Actually, we counted 11 sniper in that picture there. Um, and it's brilliant. You know, we really, we're kind of, what we've done, we've killed some of our reed to create some muddy patches in the reed bed. By doing that, it's become this real hot spot, but it's not just a snipe, you know, you'll get dunned in there, we'll get green shank in there, green sandpipers in there, you know, black tail godwits, kind of, there's waders will just drop in. And they use an Ottawa as like a service station, they're literally dropping in, feeding for a few days, and then they'll head off on their journey. Um, so we are literally like, like back into a service station or something like that, <laughs> basically for birds. Um, and also otters are a really cool, cool thing, which, um, Again, in my early days, I remember when we, um, we found an otter spray, we went, oh, it was an otter spray, we put it in a box and we labelled it and got some of the new otter sprays to check it. And we were all excited because otters were kind of appearing on the moor. Um, and how they're actually, they're quite common on the moor, you know, and I've, I've seen numerous times. And me and my, my warden, Fergus, actually, we were, we were working by this pump and we built these sandbags up to keep the water away from us. The river was literally there and we were repairing this kind of entrance to pipe and this pump and we were digging down and down like this and suddenly we looked along and this swan started to swim towards us with its, its wings arched like that and we was like what's going on now birds look at this I'm like whoa and this swan just swam straight past us and then suddenly behind it an otter was swimming and I'm not joking from, from where you're on the front row from us that's how far away this otter just swam straight past us didn't notice us because me and Fergus were just like <gasps> <laughs> I just watched it go past, it climbed up on the bank, it kind of looked around and then disappeared. I'm going to show you something which I hope works. I did practice it earlier. This is actually um, a video footage on one of our trail cameras. We've got trail cameras around the reserve, and this is video footage only literally, you see today, 15th of, um, 15th of February. Here we are, two o'clock in the morning. This is up at our reef bed. Watch this. Fingers crossed this is going to work. There we go. <laughs> There we go. Female otter, three young, on Otmore. Literally, this is a couple of days, you know, yesterday, wasn't it? Yesterday we picked up. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? How special is that? It's not just about birds. Right, moving on to um, some of the work that we're doing in the winter time, in, in kind of this, this winter period, is, is the reed bed management. So we're, we're out cutting the reed and we're trying to create open areas. Again, I said earlier, it's about mosaic, it's not having everything at the same age, you want to cut it down short, so we've got young stuff, old stuff, and that's what we're out doing on the rebed. But also, um, the really interesting thing for us now at the moment is, is the winter in wildfowl. 
Um, and we have some serious, some years we have some seriously high numbers of winter and wildfowl now. And uh, these, these, these things are really kind of linked to water levels. If we have a really dry year, we hardly have anything. And if we have a really wet year, the populations go up. And I'm just going to run through some species here. So we've got widgeon. You can see the widgeon here, it kind of goes up and down, up and down. And literally that, that period that's 11 and 12 and 18, 19, you can see when they're really low. That's when we had hardly any rain. Literally no rain the whole winter. We hardly get any winter and wildfowl. And then the, the 12, 13, you can, 12, 13, 14, you can see we have really high flooding. Um, you know, the populations just go up. But, you know, we're talking, you know, populations of over 3,000 widgeon we get on site. And we are shovel out. You can see that similar populations again. You see that 11, 12, really low, but then we have the flood years. It's really high. You know, again, we've got, you know, we've got over 250, 300 shovel up. We've actually got nationally important numbers of shovel up on our moor. Nationally important numbers. We're actually only three birds short of having internationally important numbers of shovel up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be watching the webcams this year as they're coming in thinking, are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? Can we push it over? So, so we're really, really close to that figure. But, but, you know, this is an inland site with nationally important numbers of shovel up. Um, pintail as well, you know, we can have, some years we can have over 500 pintail on Otmore. Absolutely amazing. And then golden plover, you know, golden plover and lapwing numbers are in the four or five thousand figure. And again, we are have, we have nationally important numbers of golden plover. And somebody was chatting to me earlier thinking, oh, I can't go and have a look at Otmore. You know, I was out there today and there is just flocks and flocks of golden plover and lapwing just flying around the sky, you know, with a flock of widgeon will go past as well. It's an amazing kind of wetland area, which is, yeah, it's only a few miles up from here. And yet we've got these numbers, these seriously high numbers using the site. Um, and the other one, I shouldn't mention these because these are a bit of a headache for me. This is the starlings. Now, I explain to people why they're a bit of a headache to me because everyone loves the starling murmuration. We've all watched kind of the autumn watches and winter watches and we've seen these incredible murmurations and stuff like that. And they are amazing. The problem is everyone wants to come and see them or not more. And we only have a very small car park, and there's reasons for that. But um, so it can get really, really busy for the starling murmuration. And um, you know, we're trying to manage it, we're trying to do the best we can. It is a bit of a headache. You know, my advice to you, I mean, the starlings are pretty much gone now, so I wouldn't go for starlings now. You know, if you do come back next year, my advice is you know, try and do it midweek if you can. You know, it's the best time to do it. If you go on a weekend, it is really busy. Do not, whatever you do, try and go down there between Christmas and New Year or New Year's Day because that's when everyone goes there. So just a word of advice, avoid it for that period. But it is amazing. It is a spectacle. They're quite frustrating because not every time do they give the murmuration. Sometimes, you know, they don't and they just come in just large numbers, which is still amazing. The sound of the wind beat over your head is incredible. But, um, but if you can get that moment when they do a proper murmuration and there's that swirling around, that shape falling, if you're lucky, a peregrine may go through the middle of it or a sparrow ball, and then it's something all change and dot out of direction. And then they just, ah, it's amazing, just that swirling around. And then there's this trigger. I don't know what it is. I don't know who, what the trigger is, how they do it. But at some moment, they then just pour out the sky. And I always think it's like a, a jug of milk just pouring it out. They just pour out into the reed bed. And then the most amazing bit is actually just chattering. They don't shut up. And it's like, if I go around there at night doing other surveys, and you just get the whole time, they're just chattering away, chattering away, it's amazing. But it is incredible. But anyway, let's move on to a few other species and tell you some of the success stories that we've had. So, um, so this is the Marsh Harry I said earlier, we've got them breeding now on site. You know, I said they, they're now resident, they're there all the time. You will always see a Marsh Harrier pretty much when you go to Otmore. Um, they bred for the first time in 2015. Every year since then they've bred and they've fledged young. Um, if you're lucky, you might be able to kind of get a food, you know, a food pass in the food. You can see the food being dropped off here, a male bringing in, female coming up and grabbing the food um, and catching it. So they're, they're doing that regularly over the reed bed in the springtime. Um, this year we actually had, we had two nests and we fledged six young. Six new marsh carrier carriers are now flying around kind of Oxfordshire, you know, and, and you know, it's, it's only a matter of time before they will start to spread out, you know, and they may well decide to come, you know, down along, along the kind of the gravel heads or beds or some of the reed areas along, along kind of the M4 corridor almost, you know, you could end up with marsh harriers breeding down there. I think it's probably a matter of time. Um, Another bird we've had great success with is the bittern. 
Um, and these bred successfully for the first time in, in 2016. Um, and it, it's absolutely amazing. You know, and with the marsh harrier and the bittern, they were species which I explained earlier about the, the red shank and snipe and the clover. They were literally in the field next door, they had to fly over the hedgerow. They were easy, easy to get those to move on to what we for. But these guys, the closest breeding populations, are all the way over in, as I said, over in Cambridgeshire or down the Somerset levels. You know, that's a long distance for these birds to kind of find their way inland and start breeding on our root beds. Um, but they did. It's taken a long time. As I said, these ones in 2016, the Marsh Harriers in 2015, when they first bred successfully. Um, and it is, it is a great success story. Actually, the business this year, we had three boomers, three boomers and three nests as well, which is it's just brilliant on a former arable field. That's what you've got to go away tonight is just thinking this on a former arable field. So these are the things that we predicted would happen. Let me introduce you to our cranes. Now, the cranes, I remember chatting to one of our reserve ecologists when we heard about the Great Crane Project, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about down at the Somerset levels, um, where they brought, basically they brought eggs over from Germany, they reared them, come down the um, Slim Ridge Way, and then they released them. They did that for a number of years, and then we had this population of crane, which are basically spreading out. When I heard about the crane project in the early days, I was like, oh, what about cranes? And I was like, I don't get cranes a lot more. Almost too busy, too many people around me. It's just it just won't work for cranes. That's what I was told. That's what I'm like, okay, you know these people know more than me. Anyway, on in um, 2015, we actually had the first pair of cranes turn up on our wall, and we did occasionally have them pass through. Most years we had cranes would drop in and they'd disappear, um, just on, on kind of just moving around the countryside. But 2015, we had our first pair, and then we were told, oh no, they're three years old. They don't breed when they're three years old. It would take longer than that, and then they, they attempted to breed the first year. And they were called Maple Glory and Wycliffe. And then for the next kind of five years, they came back each year, they attempted to breed and every year they failed. It was, oh, it was heartbreaking. You know, my team, I, yeah, we, we're quite we're quite a tough bunch really. You know, we put up the things, we've got flapping nests get predated and stuff like that. But when you, you know, we put a lot of effort into these cranes, a lot of effort monitoring them. And then when they do get predated, and one of them, they, they got one chick to six weeks old, sort of get to 10 weeks, and it got to six weeks old and then something happened. And, and as I say, it's a time when I see my team absolutely gutted, you know, absolutely gutted we are. But, you know, it's just what happens. So anyway, all the way up until 2020, they, they fail. Um, and then in, um, I should put their names up actually, in, um, in 20, they've all got names, sorry, they've all got names because they're named by local school children. So in, in 2020, um, during the, the pandemic period, um, we had actually Excalibur and Tech, they turned up. And um, so that was quite exciting. They were a new pair, they were quite young as well. And they actually decided to nest at the other end of the moor. So we had one at the, the western end of the moor and one at the eastern end of the moor. They didn't get on, they fought continuously, very territorial. They don't like each other. They have the you could almost draw a line down the moor. I could work out where their territories were. And one would go up to and the other one would go up to. Um, but anyway, they, they both bred that year, but they both failed again. And Excalibur and Ted, um, sadly, their chick only got to about 10 days old. It wasn't very long at all, old at all. Um, so that, that was really, really sad. But then the next year, so this is last year, 2021, um, well, at the end of 2020, in the summer, we noticed that Maple Glory, this one here, was on her own, and Whitecliffe had disappeared. And that's odd, because cranes pair for life, they're always together, you know, especially in their breeding grounds, you always seem together. So we were a bit suspicious of something happened. The guys down in Somerset, because the cranes then migrate down to Somerset and they spend the winter kind of Somerset Devon area. And we, we mentioned it to them and they said actually Wycliffe didn't turn up that winter. So something happened to Wycliffe. There was a period when he was injured and he could well have been in fighting with Ted and he could have got injured in that. We don't, we don't know. We definitely saw him dangling leg at one point. Um, but something happened to him. So 2021, we're a bit of what's going to happen. Um, and basically Scalabur and Ted turned up. Um, and then Maple Glory turned up on her own and she was bugling around on her own. It was really sad to hear her bugling. It's just like, mm, you're on your own. You know, what's going to happen? Um, Excalibur and Ted actually set up their nest. Um, let me just show you their nest. Their nest location is slightly different nest where you can see the nest there on the ground side. They actually set, normally they nest in a reedy area, but this is in Greater Ponset. But they, they basically set up this nest, which is right next to where Maple Glory wanted to nest. Um, but at the same time, just go back a slide, um, Moonraker, which is a, a youngster from a bird called Gemma, so this is an unrung male, 
Um, so it's actually been bred into, into the wild population. Turned up with this bird called Bop Bop. So they kind of turned up together. They've been on the moor before. Bop Bop have been on the moor before. Um, but basically, what happened is Maple Glory chased away Bop Bop and ended up kind of pairing up with Moonraker. Um, and basically, all 2021, there was continuous fighting going on between the two sets of pairs. And what happened? Maple Glory and Moonraker would clear all the way over to Chimney Meadows, which is the Bee Barrel Reserve on the other side of Oxford, and they'll spend a few days over there, and then they'll come back again, and then they'll be fighting, and then they'll clear off again, and then they'll come back again. But basically, Maple Glory never bred that year, um, but Excalibur and Ted did breed. Um, and actually, as I said, this is their, their nest location where they nested. And actually, this is their chick. This is a gorgeous little junior chick um, that they had. And it's absolutely amazing. We managed to get some photos of it, which is really cool. This is a really secluded part of the moor. Um, you know, they, they hate people. They will not, as soon as you're near them, they'll just disappear. They really don't like people. Um, and then this is the chick on the far, on the, well, your right hand side. You can see the chick, I think, got, got the black markings on its head. So this is a chick when it was uh, quite a few weeks old, almost at the point of pledging this was. You can see how, how the grass has really turned. Up. It's really hard to spot them actually. Um, so we were getting quite excited by this point, and then we actually had photos of them flying. And you know what? They chose to fly when I, fly when I was around them more. <laughs> gutted, absolutely gutted. I never actually saw them at the fledging point. It was kind of like when I was on holiday at the point. It was just like, no. But anyway, they, they did fledge a chick, Excalibur and Ted, and that was seen back on the Somerset levels on the 21st of March, uh, 21st of September. And it's just absolutely amazing. And this is the first time we think, we can't be certain, but in about over 500 years, the cranes have bred successfully in Oxfordshire. Absolutely incredible story. Um, and hot off the press for you, um, Maple Glory turned up with the male. We suspect it's probably Moonraker, but we can never be 100% certain to have the ring on that male. But she turned up last Friday, um, which was amazing. And then yesterday I saw Excalibur and Ted in the field that they nested in last year, they turned up yesterday. So, and already, I mean, if you go down Walmart, again, you will hear bugling cranes, I think, in the next few weeks if you go down there. And they just do this really amazing bugling call. It's just incredible. And, and already, within the day of the two pairs being there, they're bugling. And um, the amazing thing is, actually, I could hear bugling. Our office is, is actually not on the other base, it's up on the hill. And we could hear bugling from our office. And local people in the villages were just like, what's that strange noise that's going down there? Ah, it's cranes bugling. It's like, who ever heard of cranes bugling on your whole base? When was the last time that was heard? Absolutely amazing. Anyway, I must crack on with time. Um, so that's some of the success stories we've had, had with the birds. Um, I'm now going to chat with you um, just some of the, the restoration work we've been doing. Because we haven't stopped. As I said, we, we took on that MOD lab, which is next door to the reserve. Um, and last year we had the big machines out again. This is our rotary ditch. Remember, I told you about the ditching machine to create those ditches. This is the machine that was working out in the MOD area. Had to get the bomb disposal lot in again. It was okay. <laughs> it was okay this time. Um, but they basically were out there. And, and this machine, as I say, it basically has a blade and it pulls it along through the soil. It cuts through the soil. And there's a big drum which basically turns around and spreads the spoil out to the side. Because it spreads it very thinly, it means we can do the work in the floodplain. Because the environment agency don't like us building up lots of spoil. We can't just dig a hole in the ground and dump it because we're reducing the flood storage capacity. If you spread it thinly like that, they're really happy about it and it works really well. So basically, that's what we were doing with it. And here's a nice aerial photo of what we created. Um, and already these are all full up, so I'm really happy. Um, I've kind of got it right, got my levels right. I'm out there sketching it with a bit of paper. I was, watching it continuously and calculating, doing the sums to make sure we're getting the right height and the right levels. But basically that's it finished, that's the MOD area. So the main reserve is actually down at the bottom end of the picture down here. So you know, we normally see this area. But the bit I want to point out to you, and I'm going to try and get fancy now with this mouse. You see these green fields here, and this green field here, and then this green field over here, and then this collection of buildings, okay? Basically, that, that's called Otmore Farm. And again, some of you may have picked up on this because we've been doing, we've basically got the option to buy this farm. A few years ago, we got this option to buy the farm. 
And we basically um, a, a ran an appeal in the last, you know, started it in about September, August time. And we ran an appeal to kind of raise money and ask people the public to donate. Um, and I'm delighted to say now, here's the farm here, we've actually acquired on the 10th of February, we actually bought the farm. So we're now proud owners of Otmore Farm, which is this, this farm over here. And it's going to be made, I mean, this is about 24 hectares of in, heavily improved pasture. You can see how green it was. So we're going to look to do similar to what we've done, um, similar to what we've done in the other fields. We'll be looking at kind of putting in ditches and stuff like that and wetting it up. This is going to be, I think it's going to be prime curly habitat. I think it's right in the curly heartland. And I think we can do some really, really good stuff with that. But it also means we can put our reserve base down there because at the moment we're in rented accommodation. So we can actually set up a reserve base and we can have more space for our machinery. Hence why I'm buying this hay cutting machinery and stuff like that. We'll have somewhere to store it. Um, and it's going to be a lot better. It's not going to work as a, it's not going to be like a visitor center or anything like that. Um, and the main reason for that is it's basically, it's stuck out on the other side of the MOD firing range, you know, and then we've got a track to go down. It just doesn't, doesn't lend itself for that side of it. Um, and so, you know, the immediate future for Otmore is, um, is the car park. We are looking at doing the car park extension, but that's, you know, we've got a lot of other things to juggle around with that. But we're not going to look at kind of improving the facilities and stuff like that. And the, the reason behind that is because the local community, when we acquired the first fields, they didn't want us to turn up more into a big tourist visitor destination. And, and you know, we agreed to that. Um, they, they consented and said that they're, they're happy with the car park extension, but they don't want us to do any more development down there. So we, we're turned as a quiet enjoyment site. Um, you know, it's more about the conservation than kind of getting masses and masses of people down there. It is quite a challenge in my role because Otmore is an amazing place and more people to see it. But then often the people that come there like Otmore because it's a really quiet and peaceful place and it doesn't have masses. And I'm kind of stuck between a bit of a rock and a hard place to trying to meet, meet the needs of everyone. But um, I think you would all agree we're, we're doing all right on the conservation side. We're certainly focusing on that and, and having great success. So as I said, we, we actually have succeeded on our appeal. Um, no, which is absolutely amazing. So that's the end of my talk. I've done well to pop out. <laughs> so I think we've got about 15 minutes until we're thrown out, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes or so. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Are you ready to answer some questions? Of course I can. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Any from the hall? You um, have trouble with um, tree pruning or is the reed too young? Or, or well, trees in the reed are. Yeah, tree growth. Yeah. yeah, so in the early days, the willows were a real problem because what happened was we would keep the water levels low to establish the reed, and it was kind of low enough for the willows to go in. So we spent, although we spent hours and hours planting reeds, we also spent hours and hours pulling out the willows because very quickly it would have become dominated in willows. But what's happened now, because we hold the water levels very high, the willows are, are not so much of a problem. But we are actually allowing the willows to establish, particularly the goat willow. We're quite happy with the goat willows, it's quite low. So we're actually allowing pockets of goat willow to kind of establish in the reed beds. Again, it's just getting that structure. So we can have some willow, but we just don't want it to be dominant. And if we, if we hadn't formed it in the early days, and there are some reserves out there that didn't quite realise it, and they Quickly become very dominated with willow and they found really, really hard to establish. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's just you don't, yeah, willow car and stuff is, is a good habitat, but we were focusing on the reed. That, that was what we wanted, was a reed bed. Um, yeah, that's very much our focus. Well, we just had a request from uh, on Zoom saying can you repeat any questions from the Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Carl. Um, in 
<laughs> yeah. Questions. How how long before we get stalks turning up? Yeah. Well, as we know, they're, they're in the country. You know, they are breeding successfully in the country. So, yeah, it could be just a matter of time. And actually, this is why I find wetlands very exciting because there are a lot of colonists which are kind of moving up. You know, with with um, in a way climate change, but with also the fact that we created these amazing wetlands, especially down in the Avalon marshes down in Somerset. You know, there's incredible species now which are starting to use those those habitats, you know, purple heron and all the bits and, and stuff like that. So actually, aside from bottom wall, I think anything could turn up. Um, you know, my ward is desperate for the glossy ibis to breed. You know, last year we had a few which were kicking around, and he's absolutely desperate for that to happen. But but yeah, there's all sorts that can happen. I think colonists on, on the rebates are going to be really exciting on our board, um, as to what's going to happen on that area. Yeah. Judith? Was it here uh, about the status of the MOD land that you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Has the RCB taken over that or does it still belong to the MOD? Yeah, so it's still MOD, it's still a rifle range, they still use it. What happened was, um, it's actually the farmer who owns Bottle Farm, he, he used to have a tenancy of the southern part of it and basically he, he retired and said he didn't want to take the southern, you know, keep on tenancy. So we become tenants of it. So the southern part of it with the tenants. Um, and then we work with the farm. There's actually three, three farmers that kind of manage that area. And we work with the other farmers on there as well. So they're really good people that are doing some good stuff on there as well. Um, but basically, yeah, we become the tenants. And that, that was about, um, about 62 hectares we acquired, basically part of that tenancy. So that's really exciting. So some, all the other stuff we've had has been the arable land. Whereas this MOD land is triple SI, so it's a site of special scientific interest, so it's really nice wildlife areas. Um, and yeah, I think we can do some really good stuff on there. It's going to be good fun. Yeah. Question over there. Well, the comment really. You said the M40 went around up more on your last map, the Roman road went straight north down <laughs> through the middle of it. <laughs> it the comment yeah. saying that the. It must have been ambitious then. Is there a causeway or a raised bit? Or have you find any trace of it? So on the one hand, we've, had, we've got the M40 going around Otmore, but in uh, olden times, the Roman road ran straight across it. No environmentalists in those days. <laughs> so, yeah, the Roman road is actually, is still there as a scheduled entry monument on Otmore. Um, and you can, it actually goes, you can, you can see it on the map, and it goes right across the middle, as you say. And actually, if you stand, you can stand on it and you can see it is raised up. So, there is actually obviously they put a lot of stone down and put the timber down and stuff like that. So, you, you can stand on it and you can see where it drops away into the lower bits of the side. It's literally, you know, like a bit of a track or, you know, a car or something like that. But you can see where it actually runs. Um, and then you can like, look at the two, I forget now, not that great on it, but you can see like the two Roman towns, I think Arrochester and the other ways, it's almost you draw a line between them, you can see a dead straight line where the Roman road would have gone between the two. Um, but yeah, it's you know it's quite interesting. Yeah. Jane. So you might need to attract some of the tits. <laughs> <laughs> Question is are we likely to um, attract bearded tits? I hate bearded tits. <laughs> I don't. I love them. They're beautiful birds, but yeah, I hope we do one day. They're, they're the one that we haven't got. We've, well, I say this. So they have appeared, and we have had them occasionally on you know, the you know, winter in. Um, there's a potential that they may have bred one year because a very juvenile one was picked up on our green bed, um, but we never picked up on surveys or anything like that. So they may well have bred at least one year. Well, it's not 100% proven that they actually did. Um, and then they never bred after that as well. So I think we will one day, but for some reason, they just, they've just not really come to us. But, um, but yeah, it will be a good one to get, yeah. I actually had a picture, of, I was going to do a couple of slides of, of you know, potential to happen, and I've got a bit of sitting there that I took it out. They just, <laughs> just disappoint me so much. I don't like failing of something, and I'm failing of being a tit. It's kind of frustrating, but yes, we'll get there. One day, we'll hit the ping and be a tit. Uh, Rob, can I, can I have a question? Yeah, Renton. Um, I, I may have missed a bit because I had to cut out in the, in the middle of your talk, I'm afraid. Um, 
how important has predator control been and what the what methods did you use? Mm -hmm. So we do do predator control on the reserve uh, and we do control of foxes. Um, now, RSPB are very cautious about our predator control and uh, we have to demonstrate that there's a problem and that, that you know, the predators are causing a problem. Um, and the way that we control the foxes on site is, is by shooting them. Um, so we've got a, a local person we work with who basically goes out at night and kind of identify where the foxes are and basically he shoots them. And basically that, that's the method we use on site. And we have proven that the control that we're doing is successful. Um, and we can see you know, where we started the control and kind of where the fledging success is in, you know, increased and stuff like that. But it's something we, as an organization, um, probably understand and take very seriously. Um, but as I said, we do do the, the box control part of it on, on site. Right. Uh, do, for, uh, do you use predator fencing? I'm thinking particularly of the smaller predators. Yeah, so uh, that's the bit you may have missed. So yeah, we have put up credit. We've got a permanent, a permanent predator fence on one of our fields that covers about 40 hectares. And that, that's been really successful in keeping out the foxes and the badgers. Um, and then we do have some um, more mobile fences that we put around um, the curling nests to kind of protect those more specifically. But they, they're quick fences that we just put up very quickly. All they've got to do is, is kind of, you know, deter the predator for about three, four weeks or something. And then, you know, then we take the fence down. But it's often it's enough. Um, I think the chap earlier was talking about the height of them. All we're looking at is literally just zap, zap them on the nose and then they just, oh, just go off that way. But if we have left that up for a longer period, then eventually learn that they can just jump if they want to go in there as well. But we, we find it's enough to deter them for that very short window. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. So what's missing from Altmore if he wants to create a natural balance? Ooh, what's missing? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, if we were really purist on Altmore, the potential thing we could do is kind of take down all the flood banks and actually allow it to kind of go to that total naturally functioning system. Um, but the challenge we've got is that because there's, there's not a lot of wildlife in the wider area, we don't have it spread out enough, you know, and it is so precarious, the numbers and the populations we've got. At the moment, we can control the water levels and we can kind of manage it, you know, and it's, it's almost like we need to get to that step where, you know, they're, they're using, you know, as I said, you know, the beef outside over at Gallagher Bridge, you know, we've got Gresham doing well there, you know, and we kind of got them spreading across the upper Thames area. And, you, if we get to the point where you know the upper tent tributary has got really well managed land, it's got waders using all of it, you know, that's when we could potentially get really purist and say, actually, let's let's put this into more of a, a naturally functioning system. But it's more complicated than that because in the upper tent, you still got sluices and weirs which are holding water back. So it's never going to be that that fully natural system. Yeah. Judith. Did the nest estate that managed to attract um uh, several dogs in quite considerable numbers. What is that more not? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's more of the geography because they're down in Sussex, and I said to you it's that rain shrinking. So actually, you know, the turf dog population in the Sussex area and the Kent area is, is very high. And if you would put net up in Oxfordshire, I don't think that they have the numbers of turf dogs that they've got down there. I don't think they have any. <clears throat> in all honesty. Um, but their management, certainly from what I've read, I've not been down there and actually seen it. Um, but obviously they, they you know they've got much larger areas of scrub. Um, and then they've also got that management of the pigs and you know the kind of turning up soil and stuff like that. Um, but I don't think it's I don't think it's the habitat that's wrong on our wall. I think the habitat is okay. It's just that the whole population is shrinking and it's kind of moving, you know, why would a bird have to fly all the way up to a lot more to nest if there's enough habitat for it in like Sussex and Kent and, you know, Suffolk, all of those areas, that, that's where they can go into. Um, and it is just this rain shrinking, you know, they don't need to go all the way up to where we are, they don't need to. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's, it's a challenging one. It is a really challenging one for us. Mm. Well, sadly, I, I think we've got to bring the evening to, to an end because time has caught up with us. Um, 
just like to thank David for a really interesting and entertaining talk. Um, for those of us who, who know Otmore, we'll see it in a new light when we go there next time and realise that it's all been created out of arable land. And for those who've not been there before, well, let's get on there quick. Thank you and see you in two weeks. Thank <laughs> you.